honey are a huge part of the book, uh, the entire middle section. Many people are concerned about the bees. Can you talk a bit about how growing GMOs affects the bees? It's simple. It's just the pesticides. The pesticides are, you know, the, the, the bees are coming in contact with, whether because they're on the plants or because the plants have actually sucked them into every fiber of their being and they're in the flowers and in the nectar and in what's called the gutation drops, which is this little sort of dewy drops that the plants emit, um, that the bees drink for water. Um, all of that is, we found pe pesticides in all of this. The last section of the book is partially about corn contamination in Oaxaca and the scientists who discovered that U.S. grown corn was contaminating the 10,000-year-old land races of Oaxaca. Is it possible to get pure, non-GMO corn anywhere? Well, that's a great question. I, I don't know. Because of cross-breeding and pollination and um, birds and bees and animals, you know, is it possible to get anything pure anymore is really the essential question of the book. I try to... I try to tease that apart in the book, but that's a great question. I don't know. Your hero and guiding voice throughout the book is Rachel Carson, uh, specifically her book, Silent Spring. Uh, we know you've said that you developed a strong bond with that work and with her spirit, as you wrote. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, reading, rereading Silent Spring as an adult and then rereading it while I was working on the book was really important to me. Uh, what was shocking was that she published the book in 1962 and she was already talking about some of the issues that still, the still some of the problems that have still not been fixed, some of the same pesticides we're using and the dangers of them. Um, she was, uh, you know, the question is what happened? How do we let this happen? This book was a bestseller. She was honored by President Kennedy. Um, after she died, two years later, the, you know, Various programs were, 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 DDT was banned, the uh, Clean Water Act. I mean, it seemed like we were on the right track, <laughs> and yet we're still using the same pesticides that she wrote about in 1962, other than DDT. T. Since Trump was elected, what's going to happen to the environment? How do you think a Trump presidency will affect how our agriculture is changing the environment? Now we're two years into Trump, so that was that's a question that was should be dusted off here. But we 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 see what Trump's doing to the environment. I mean, he's interested only in business, and um, I don't. How, what are the horrors that we could enumerate since Trump was elected? <laughs> like it's just the the situation we have done. We've gotten nowhere. How about that? We've gotten nowhere with so many things because Trump was elected and we're spending so much time listening to his vitriol and listening to, you know, having the government shut down so we can build a wall and um, having him, you know, uh, appoint somebody as dangerous as Scott Pruitt to the EPA. We, we've, 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 um, having all these standards rolled back. I mean, we are, um, we have backslid and it's terrifying. So we aren't even talking about our agriculture or even dealing with any of the problems. I think it's gotten worse. Modified made some of the best of lists in 2016. Uh, Publishers Weekly and Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop among them. Uh, then a main literary award for 2017. And you've been speaking about the book around the country at the Commonwealth Club of San Francisco and at the 92nd Street Y in New York City. What's that been like for you? I'm happy to go where people want to hear this information. Um, You know, I'm, I, I, I like to meet people and to read the book and to talk about it and talk about writing it. Um, I, I, I wish that um, I could engage more people around this subject um, about the, what we're doing to the environment with the way we're growing food. But it's a start. You spend most Saturdays at the farmer's market gathering local foods to cook for your family. How has this changed for your family life and your kids' relationship to food? We know all of our farmers. There are celebrities in our house. Our, farmer, our kids know where things come from. They um, ask for specific things. They um, like to go pick out our potatoes or carrots or mustard greens. Um, I think that really changes a person to know where their food comes from. 
I had that as a child because my parents were growing it. In our case, you know, we grow some things, but my kids know the, the rock stars who are growing these awesome things that we're trying. How do you think others can start to shop more locally, and how important is organic? Uh, can one eat locally and organically everywhere around the country? Um, what are our farmers doing all around the country uh, that perhaps they haven't been over the last several years? I mean, we've had seen an incredible, um, incredible explosion of farmers markets, um, young people farming, especially in Maine where I come from, young people coming back to the state or moving to the state to farm. Um, you know, farming is, is very important and the people who are taking it on and trying to do it without pesticides and doing it in new innovative ways should be supportive. So yeah, going to farmers markets, buying organic, asking tough questions. Um, we all can do this and we just have to summon the energy and the strength and the time to, you know, cook some carrots rather than go buy a cheeseburger. And um, it's a it's a mindset change, but once you make that change, it's actually relatively easy. I say, tell people, you know, just always have in your fridge a, a, a bean, like a dry bean that you've soaked and cooked, a grain and some vegetables, and you can make pretty much anything. You know, you can buy tortillas and make tacos. You can, you can make, um, you know, just beans and rice or beans in the grain. You can make, um, you know, if you buy noodles, you can buy, make, use some of those things as the base of a lasagna. Um, you know, you just, you, your options open extensively, so. Has anyone ever told you that your book has changed how they buy food too? Absolutely, people have told me that the book has changed them um, and uh, they've changed so many things in their lives and that's, there's nothing more gratifying. We know you cook from scratch a lot, um, but during the holidays, we imagine the bar gets even higher and you must be cooking nonstop. What did you make this past holiday season that you were especially excited about? Um, yeah, I do cook a lot. I make a lot of things from scratch, almost everything, especially during the holidays. Um, my son just wrote a really beautiful essay at school, my 10-year-old, about this toffee that I make um, that has chocolate on top, and we have it every Christmas Eve. And I was especially excited to, I went to a writing celebration at his school to hear his essay about how the toffee makes Christmas Eve night for him. Um, and all of my recipes are ones that I've made up, that I've tinkered with over the years, sometimes written down. My family has likes to groan at me because they'll be like, this is amazing, how did you do it? And I have no idea. I didn't write it down. It happens all the time. Um, so over the years, I've been writing down the toffee recipe, and he actually helped me write down some of it so that he could put the recipe in his piece that he wrote with no help from me. I, I didn't even know what I was going to hear at this celebration. It was such a beautiful um, honoring of food and family and of our traditions and my efforts to make beautiful, beautiful, I, I try to make really beautiful food and food that's really healthy and delicious. Um, so that was really exciting for me. You know, I, I came up with a, um, we, we don't eat gluten or corn and we eat all organic. I came up with a, um, a like a buttery uh, garlic um, roll this year um, that I, sort of tinkered with a Bon Appetit recipe and to, to get it right. The Bon Appetit recipe was for gluten. And those were terrific, and I was really excited about those. And those were so great that the same son um, asked to have them at his birth, for his birthday breakfast this January. So I made them the night before and had them. And you know, I like giving that stuff to my family. They're very private, they're special. They, you know, I don't have a cookbook or anything like that out yet. Um, so it's like, you know, these are, these, these are part of our traditions and they, they feel like they're just ours. That's nice. People have been telling me to do a cookbook for years. Um, I've written about food in all of my books and um, maybe. Is there a good GMO? And likewise, is there a good pesticide? Well, for the pesticide, here's what I would say. One of the um, scientists in my book said, um, if it's designed to kill something, nobody can tell you it's safe. So that's a good rule of thumb. No pesticides are ever going to be a good idea. A good GMO, that's a little more complicated. Yeah, there, there may be some, some, like in China, they're trying to develop a wheat that um, will need less fungicides. 
is that going to be a good thing? Maybe is the is the um, the mosquito that's going to be bred um, to combat Zika, the Zika virus? Is that going to? It's a GMO mosquito, right? Is that going to be a good thing? It, it might be, you know. Um, so we can't just across the board say these say something like a GMO is bad. We can probably say across the boards pesticides are bad, chemicals are bad. Um, but some of these other solutions that we may need, if we say that, <laughs> you know, we have to have an open mind. We can't just say it's all bad um, because then we get nowhere, right? We're not going to get rid of all of those things. So.